everybody. Um, nutritional status is a strong predictor of post-operative outcomes, or in other words, what you eat or don't eat impacts your surgery recovery. As stated in an article titled Pre and Post-Surgical Nutrition for Preservation of Muscle Mass, Strength, and Functionality Following Orthopedic Surgery, which comes from the National Library of Medicine, it states malnourished patients have longer lengths of stay, higher readmission rates, a greater number of complications and higher mortality risks. I see you nodding your head. <laughs> You're agreeing with me already. It also states that an estimated 24 to 65% of surgical patients ranging from young adults to the elderly undergoing major surgery are malnourished or at risk of malnutrition, a percentage that only increases over the course of a hospital stay. And that is why in today's podcast, we're talking about nutrition as a strategy to your pre-surgery preparation and your post-surgery recovery. Welcome to the 15-Minute Chronic Pain Experience Podcast. I am your host, Dina Chopolis, and I am the head pain coach and chief curator at Pain to Possibilities. I am very excited to introduce you to my guest, Diane Johnson. Hi, Diane. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to have you here, guys. I will let our people know kind of who you are and what you do before we get into our conversation. Diane is an expert in student athlete nutrition and nutrition in general. Uh, she is certified in holistic nutrition and sport nutrition. She is a former high school teacher and volleyball coach. Uh, she is a certified yoga instructor. She's also trained in mindfulness and meditation and is the founder and creator of Guts, where it is Diane's mission to change the nutrition culture in youth sport so young athletes can feel better, experience few, fewer injuries, and crush their sport dreams while developing positive body image and a long-lasting healthy relationship with food. Diane also moved from her teaching career to her newfound love of working with athletes. Um, not newfound, she's been doing this forever, but um, due to health issues. And so Diane is a great one to be speaking to, and here is why. Because you might be wondering why I'm inviting Diane onto this podcast as a sports nutrition expert. Well, sit back, get comfortable, prop yourself up with as many pillows as you need to, because we're going to get into it today. All right. Um, athletes and chronic pain warriors, champions, whatever you want to call yourself, share many things. Okay. First of all, injury and injury recovery first and foremost. Secondly, uh, sport and chronic pain are both physical and emotional, or in other words, our chronic pain warriors need to play the psychological game just like an athlete would. And performance, all humans, whether they live with chronic pain or if they're athletes, need to perform at their best during the day. And when I mean perform at their best with our chronic pain community, it just means living despite the pain. Uh, but before we get into it, I want to just remind our listeners what we know about pain. Uh, first of all, we know that pain is biopsychosocial in nature, which means that all chronic illness and chronic pain has biological components, psychological components, and social components. And for us to fully understand pain, we need to, and, and to work towards recovery, we need to address all three of those aspects. And today, Diane and I are going to try our best to tackle our topic around those three items. Before we move on, when it comes to chronic pain, everything matters. Nutrition is just one of those really important pieces. And the second thing is that pain is always 100% of the time, both emotional and physical. So let's address both. So when we also, one last thing is when we talk about recovery in this podcast, it's important to know that we are addressing the recovery after surgery. Uh, the word recovery can be a bit tricky and it means that it is unique to everyone. Recovery after surgery or even long-term recovery from chronic pain looks different for everybody. And so some, for some recovery might mean getting rid of the pain and for some it might mean living life to its fullest. You know, there's so much to talk about that, but let's, let's invite Diane to this conversation. Sorry for that long introduction. So happy to have you here. We've got lots to talk about. 
<laughs> that was a great introduction. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I mean, chronic pain can get a little complex, um, just like nutrition can. So this is why I'm also really excited about it. So if we can, let's talk a little bit about the biological piece first. I recently uh, listened into one of your amazing workshops where you were talking about student athletes and injuries. Uh, and you were specifically talking about how not only prevention, but just sort of how to help in that recovery process. Some of the three key things that I really picked up and was really hoping to talk about was recovery, resiliency, and healing. Yes. And you talked about how does a nutrition strategy help our chronic pain community prepare for surgery? My whole thing with the student athletes is that uh, and it's funny that the, this is the avenue that I am pursuing to really try to spread, um, advocate for different strategies for eating than what we're typically exposed to. Mm -hmm. But really, this information is relevant for the most of our population because our food system is highly processed. It's always quick and it's quite nutrient deficient in a lot of states. So for for anyone that's approaching or coming to a point where they might be having surgery, where my brain goes is how do we get your body into the most vibrant, nourished, strong, even when we're ailing state mm -hmm. in order to prepare for the trauma mm -hmm. because it is that our body is going to go through in its healing process. Right. When we are always on the run, when we're consuming food, that's, kind of with a focus of the quickness and the ease and it cooks fast and it's, you know, it's in the bag or the box. We had just have to understand that our body at a cellular level mm -hmm. isn't getting the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the things that it needs to perform the way that it is designed to perform. Right. And so if we're thinking about, okay, well now I'm going to be going into this surgery and my body's going to have additional healing to do post-op Right. How can I set myself up for success and really like basic, the best quality foods that you can consume right. on a regular basis mm -hmm. without adding a ton of additional stress to your life? Because that's a factor, too. Right. Is going to set you up to heal faster, to even just withstand the stresses of the surgery in the moment right. in a better in a better way. So really key points there. I, um, I love the fact that, first of all, thank you for reminding me. I know you do so much more than just the student nutrition. You also mm -hmm. just deal with wellness in general. So that's why this is an important conversation with you. Secondly, trauma. Surgery is traumatic for the tissues, for the emotions, for the psychology, the whole thing. And I love the fact that you are also stating we're prepping you for better outcomes, better entrance into it. You know, you, you really are setting yourself up for more success by supporting yourself in the best possible, more fulfilling way. It's not just, you know, looking after okay, who's going to take care of the dog, who's going to pick up the kids. It's how are you supporting your, your, at a cellular level, it sounds like. Uh, so my, I guess like my personal experience, you mentioned that I dealt with some health things too. I had a full colectomy when I was 32. So that's a pretty invasive surgery with a, definitely a healing process after I wouldn't say I was managing chronic pain, but certainly had managed disease. Mm -hmm. And it was the year prior to that. I sort of intuitively, I guess, chose a specific eating strategy that really just filled my diet with good quality, whole foods, lots of lean proteins and lots of vegetables. And that was just the way I didn't know that I was preparing for surgery, mm -hmm. but the speed at which I recovered from that surgery. Now, looking back, I can just say, well, you know, of course, like my body had what it needed right. to take, to take the steps that it needed to, to set myself off in a new direction. After having been really sick, I was still cellularly strong. Mm -hmm. I feel like because of that nutrition component, um, but it's not necessarily, I don't think what we get in the mainstream, right? Like most. So I fully val I'll just say like fully value. So grateful for the medical system in the right. support of me, yes. but also seeking outside right. in information influences support in a more holistic stream was right. absolutely critical for me. Right. 
and just kind of allowed all those pieces, I think, to sort of layer in together really nicely right. um, in that process. So again, I, I did want to acknowledge that you mentioned earlier, because I know our chronic pain community, while they're listening to this, might start thinking, oh God, the anxiousness is rising when they're worried about how much effort is this going to take yes. to prepare, you know, really good foods beforehand when really making a meal can be very difficult as it is. Yeah. However, we will touch on that a little bit, but just knowing that a bit of a shift can really make a big impact when it comes to just eating, you know, good foods, it is a shift and it will take a bit of practice. Perhaps we can get people involved to help you out as well, but don't let that overwhelm sort of take over the brain and say, no, this is not possible. It's entirely possible. It just takes a little bit of know-how. And like you said, if we know what this is doing, to ourselves and how it is helping to get us ready and to help us post-operatively. Hopefully that'll make things a little bit easier. Talking about the trauma, let's get in a little bit of details around how a nutrition strategy can really help sort of minimize the stress, the physical stress or that, you know, surgery often brings on. I, th- I think, you know, our, our body just requires, like our body does the jobs it's supposed to do, whether that is digestion, like healthy metabolism, brain function, mm-hmm. um, stress management, like all of this requires nutrients like Mm -hmm. on that cellular level again right so we need those things coming from our food in order for our body to do what it's supposed to do or what it does naturally like Mm -hmm. in its most optimum divine healthy however you want to refer to its state right in terms of like I just keep peeling it back in my own life and then with clients is like how do we make sure that your body has those things so that even if we're focused on the recovery or the dealing with the stress of that moment, even at that cellular level, the body has what it needs. And then we also know that, because I feel like when we talk about the stress piece, there's a huge, the emotional piece, the psychological piece, like all of that is a big part of that conversation. Absolutely. That, that even when we're more, when our cells are healthier, when we're more physically resilient, we're going to be able to better manage the, these, the psychological, the emotional components of that stress, right. And that Mm -hmm. inflammation is a byproduct of stress. Mm -hmm. So if we're filling our diet with, you know, anti-inflammatory foods, if we're getting enough of our omega threes in like those things are still going to support Mm -hmm. our management of that stressful traumatic situation at the cellular level, they're going to make our brain more resilient to the thought process, like all of it comes back to what is happening with nutrients and things in ourselves. Absolutely. Yes. We have, like you said, the components of stress of life of surgery Mm. is the biological, the psychological and the social. So you wrapped it up, summed it up beautifully there. The more you can sort of prep yourself emotionally and physically to get through that, the better off you will be in the long run. Let's break it down maybe into a little bit more of the macros. We don't have to get too specific, but just so that people understand a little bit about the carbohydrates, the proteins, the fibers, the fats, all that stuff, just to be able to really help them through this whole process. Um, I did read somewhere that, and I'll read directly from the quote, that protein intake is especially important for modulating surgical stress and supporting recovery. Yet surgical patients significantly underconsume protein taking in about 22 to 36% of estimated requirements. So that sounds pretty low. When it comes to protein, how important is a good healthy version of protein in the either pre or and or the post recovery? I think um, it's, it's super important when I think about protein, like, especially when I'm talking to my, you know, my young athletes and we're trying to keep everything as simple as possible for them. So they know what's going on. Protein is building and recovery and healing. And so anytime that we're in a state of, like you said, trauma, 
if we're, if we've had an acute injury, if we're dealing with something for a long period of time, if we're recovering from a surgery, protein is the thing that is going to help put everything back together. It's the thing that rebuilds the tissue. And I think your comment about, you know, the quote saying statistically low levels of protein being consumed post-surgery is often like a, what's put in front of people, particularly if they're in a hospital setting, your plate doesn't usually show up with a nice, like lean piece of beautiful salmon or fit, you know, <laughs> chicken for you to consume. Or in some instances, people might even need a little bit more right. depending on what they can eat. And so how are we supporting, you know, is supplementation a factor to be considered during that time? Yeah. If our appetite or our ability to digest foods and break things down is hindered because of something from the surgery. Mm. You know, I think those are all factors that really play, play into that. I was probably after my surgery was probably like their least favorite person. <laughs> well, <laughs> because I, I, I had just come out of my nutrition training, like yes. just graduated, like the week before my surgery. And so everything they brought to me, I was just like, are you kidding? Yeah. Are you kidding me? This is what I'm supposed to eat to get better right now. Right. It's true. And so I had family bringing me food. I had my mom bringing me smoothies because, you know, just based again on what I felt like eating and could yes. digest and uh, because I knew what was there wasn't going to be enough for yeah. the weight that I wanted to recover. Right. And what a so, great strategy, actually, getting family I, to bring food in. I, yeah, well, I was, <laughs> I was just like, mm, no, nope. that's not, no, that's not no. going to help me right now. Yeah, right? no, it's true. And it yeah. also, depending on the length of stay that you're in the hospital, you know, if you are continuing Definitely. to eat food, like, what do vegans do? You know, they, they don't have a lot of choice uh, for protein either in the hospital, but mm-hmm. not to knock, you know, what, what, the hospitals are doing, they're doing one heck of a job, but, um, you're right. I think everyone's dietary needs are so unique. And when you're in the hospital for any length of time, especially at a critical point when you're in recovery mode, which most people are at that point, um, after surgery is, um, it's really important to at least understand what you need. Uh, because I don't know that the physicians have the luxury of time to be able to say, Hey, this is what you need. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, And I think it also is dependent on the, like the person going, like what their state was going in as well. Right. Like you said, the uniqueness of everyone's needs. And so, you know, were you a really big guy with a large muscle mass that was really active and you had an injury and you're going in for surgery, like your protein needs are going to still be quite high if you want to maintain that muscle mass and recover. Right. Right. Versus someone of a smaller stature who isn't as active or, you know, there's so many factors that go into that. And True. I mean, I, when I would just say for anybody that's like approaching something like this is like, be okay with being an advocate for yourself right. and, and just being like, I need someone to bring me this. I'm going to order this. I'm going to get this brought in and really allow yourself to certainly use all the resources that are there for you in the hospital, but it's okay to ask for more. Mm -hmm. You have that right, right. To like stand in your, in your power and you know, what is right for you also that we have this knowing in ourselves right? to ask for what we need. Yeah. I think that's probably the best tip of the podcast. (laughs) That's the big hitter right there. I think that that's, and it's true. It's so, so true. So thank you for bringing that up. When we talk about recovery and we talk about nutrition, making your immune system or the recovery process a little more efficient, can you touch on that a little bit? How does food help you to become a little more efficient in your healing? Proteins for sure are something to be um, cognizant cognizant of that you're getting enough. Mm -hmm. Um, And it might mean like connecting with someone to help you figure out what that is. Like some people I find are very, they really want to know how much exactly do I need? Like Mm -hmm. if you're a numbers person, that might feel really good to have that security and understanding of, okay, I know I'm doing this for myself, other people, it's too much and that's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. But to understand protein is a big piece. Carbohydrates are going to be where we get some energy from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can be pretty drained. Our cells have gone through a lot and they are going to be craving energy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the fastest form of energy that they crave is sugars. Mm -hmm. But we just want to make sure when we're looking at mitigating inflammation Mm -hmm. in a recovery process is that we're 
we're reaching for good quality carbohydrates and we try to certainly allow the sweet, right? We want the sweetness because that's an emotional thing too. Yep, yep. But to choose the good quality carbohydrates that have the actual the vitamins, the minerals that are going to also support that cellular function. Right. Um, and then the healthy fats, mm. particularly the omega-3s, because they're going to be a big factor as well in terms of mitigating inflammation. And again, sometimes the things that we find that are in front of us mm -hmm. because they're easy and they're fast. Right. Um, and maybe they just taste really good in the moment because we're tired and, you know, it's that like, where, where are we going to put our focus? Can we keep our why or our goal or however you want to kind of categorize that, but can that be forefront for us so that we're choosing things that are actually moving us forward yeah, right. instead of kind of keeping us stuck in that mm -hmm. maintenance mode? Mm -hmm you know? Right. For sure. Now, when you talk about a, a good examples of carbohydrates, cause I know there's a lot of, you know, you just say the word carbohydrate and people take it one way or the other. We need yeah. carbohydrates. Right. And I think yeah. we, we lose that, but what would be some good examples? I mean, fruits and vegetables, obviously we need to get those greens and colors in. Um, what else would be sort of a simple way of getting in those healthy carbohydrates? Yeah. I would just, I always like to think about color. Yeah. Um, so as many colorful foods as you can, mm -hmm. and then certainly the, the carbohydrates, like the rices and the quinoa, which is also protein actually, mm -hmm. and potatoes and those kinds of things too, they're going to be beneficial for you. Also lots of nutrients, but they are going to shoot your blood sugar up faster. Mm -hmm. And if you're maybe your surgery means you can't get around a lot. Mm -hmm. So you don't need, you need energy for healing, but you don't need as much energy for movement and day to day, that kind of thing. Those would be ones. And those will also increase cravings for other sweet things because your right. blood sugar goes up faster. Right. So I would say emphasize the colorful carbohydrates, certainly still getting in your good quality, whole grains, yeah. squash, um, like those kind of colorful yeah. I think of like butternut and acorn squash and those kinds of things too will add mm -hmm. lots of value. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's always for me, it's like what's what's the best bang for my buck here, right? right. Like <laughs> how can I get as much in exactly at once? Well, yeah. especially when we're talking about how each meal uh, can be difficult to create in the sense yeah. that it just hurts. Right. So yeah. now we, you mentioned about, um, inflammation and I know inflammation right now, there's some really interesting information coming out just about, especially in the acute phase, uh, and anti-inflammatories. I won't get into too many details, but basically there is some research coming out saying that if we try to medicate with anti-inflammatories too soon, that might lead to chronic pain down the road. So nutrition, then in my mind, becomes an important piece of the anti-inflammatory pie, um, especially, you know, pre or post um, operative. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to anti-inflammatory foods on a very basic level, what are some strategies that people can implement if they're thinking about inflammation? Yeah. Um, one of my favorite combinations that has like a ton of anti-inflammatory properties, but also helps pain mm -hmm. without any kind of drug, like medical drug therapy or anything is, the combination of ginger, turmeric, and pineapple. Oh. So those three, I've seen different studies come out that talk about the effects of that almost being like taking an Advil, like you get that pain relief, but at the same time, your body is getting this anti-inflammatory support from a really natural source. Mm. Um, so you could, you know, those could be blended up into a smoothie. You could mm. blend them in, put them in, make it into a tea. Right. You can add them into foods that you're eating, whether it happens, you know, the combination that all together is really potent, but even you know, you have a smoothie in the morning, it has some pineapple in it, maybe some greens and some healthy protein of some right. kind. Yeah. And then maybe there's turmeric with your chicken, you know, like we can yeah. sort of incorporate those things in different ways. Those are, that's a kind of a combo that I love. Berries are really great too. And they're nice because sometimes we have, again, that kind of craving for something sweet, sweet or you know, yes. really yummy. Yeah. So like the blueberries, the blackberries, those really dark colored fruits yeah. have a lot of that benefit as well. Right. And then even things like, um, like the good quality oils. Mm. So like a extra virgin olive oil mm. and adding those into 
to things. And again, if you can't do that yourself, is there someone around that can, you know, make your, make the marinade for your food with that mm -hmm. in it so that you just get to enjoy it or even just a little dollop in a smoothie or a soup or something like that, you know, right. you can add those things in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Salmon's a really good one too, because of its omega-3 uh -huh. content. That's true. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah I, um, and I like the fact that they're relatively easy. I mean, frozen pineapple easier to yeah. utilize than cho uh, chopping up. Yeah, a totally. We kind of have touched on the biological piece, which, you know, understanding sort of at a cellular level, how we can support our body. When we talk about the biopsychosocial model, we've touched on the biological piece. Now we're going to transition into more of the psychological piece, which is equally part of the equation and is often missed or misunderstood. Unfortunately, in our chronic pain community, there's a real belief that when we talk about the psychological, we are suggesting that it's all in your head. And 2000%, it is not in your head. Pain does come from the brain, but it doesn't mean it's all in your head. So yes, pain is real, but we want to make sure that when we are addressing acute and chronic pain, now surgery, of course, is addressing the acute pain, because it's more or less the short term. Um, but it applies to both. When it comes to understanding the psychological piece about surgery, there's so many things we could talk about. Obviously, there's the anxiety around, you know, the unknown and or I've been through this before, and I know that what it involves, and that brings up my anxiety levels. Yeah. What are ways that we can support people's emotional side? How can we support this uh, anxiousness around surgery? Oh, that's a, that's a, you've been talking. So here you go, right? Like you've yep. been talking about this. I've immediately transported back to when the nurse came to get me for my colectomy. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned like then having a surgery and going through something again, right? Like yes. the, the surgeries, like I, it's amazing how quickly we can go back to those places and all really? the emotions come yep. up, right? Yeah. Um, tools that, were very, very helpful for me was, um, I started learning and again, it's a practice, right? It doesn't just automatically switch and I can control my thoughts and I know how to manage. Like it's a really, we get to just take baby steps for ourselves through these yeah. things, but meditation was a huge tool for me. Ah, very good. Um, noticing my breath. So, you know, if you're in pain, at least my experience was that my breath was always very shallow and very tight and everything mm. was really tight, like in my mm. belly, because I was contracted, right? Because of pain yep. to be able to use the breath to re release that and then just bring like a focus into the present moment where right now in this moment, I'm okay. Right. Right now I'm okay. Yep. And right now I'm okay. Right. Mm. That to keep coming back to that. Right. Those were big. And I think there's so many resources out there for people if they want to start exploring this, mm -hmm. but my, my greatest um, learnings were definitely from working with people like yourself or, you know, like a meditation teacher that really right. could help me as things were coming up. Yes. <laughs> because, yeah. You know, we get quickly, the monkey mind comes and we quickly get pulled back into, but right now I'm in a lot of pain and right now I'm really scared Yeah, to help you navigate. And again, like the baby steps to practice through that was, a was such a gift. To me. Oh my gosh. Yes. I, I remember hearing somewhere and I love this quote, the mind is a dangerous neighborhood. Don't go it alone. And I think yeah. it's so true. And just to touch on your piece around just the emotional side of things, it is, I have an online community where we do just that. We work through this, this process of how to deal with chronic pain emotionally and physically. And like you said, it is a step-by-step -step process to be able to, to convince the brain that there is some safety to this, that it's not all bad. I mean, you know, you have to think about the good things that are going to be coming out of it. You know, what is your thought process then? Uh, are you safe in this moment? You know, all these things, how much control do I have over this? Which is of course is difficult when you're going into surgery, you don't feel like you have that control, but you do when you get into a nutrition strategy, right? You have some of that control over how you repair and heal. You used a couple of tools, a great examples of your mindfulness to help you with your surgery, um, anxiety, you know, 
beyond that, your food was really helping you too, because your blood sugar levels were probably addressed before you went into your surgery as well, which is amazing. Uh, you know, you weren't deficient. Likely you weren't deficient in much because you paid attention to what you're eating. And I think that's an important understanding as well is knowing where are you starting from before you go into surgery? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think one important side upside that I wanted to mention as well is that, um, like I kind of touched on already is that when you don't feel like you have the control, you know, you're going into a situation where it's the doctors that they're in control and we trust them and we do entrust, we trust them implicitly, uh, as we should. Um, but the control that you do have is how you're taking care of yourself in it, how you're thinking yourself through it and how you handle your recovery. Right. So there is yeah. some control in this situation. Now, which ties into the psychological piece. And there is research out there that the more we can go into this situation, this expected trauma is the more, I know I hate to say it, but the more positive, the more reasonable we can be about the surgery, the quicker the outcomes, the quicker, the better outcomes. The power of the mind mm -hmm. um, and the deep, deep connection between the mind and the body and what's happening at that cellular level right. is like, I think we're just so like just scratching the surface of what is possible yes. when, when things are in alignment with mm -hmm. what we're thinking and what we believe and reinforce mm -hmm. in, in our body based mm -hmm. on our thoughts. Right. right? So certainly when, when they, like, I've never been so scared as when I had that. I even knew like it was, it was an emergency, like it was planned where I knew I like, know the steps, yep. but I've never, ever been so scared, but to have just this kind of under current or this belief in my mind that this was the right thing, that mm -hmm. I was in good hands, that there was, you know, I was supported. Yep. I had everything that, you know, and, and the, a practiced, like you said, it takes practice, but thoughts that are supporting where you want to go. Right. Exactly. Right. Where, what do you want life to look like? Yep. Cause it's not the pain that mm -hmm. is not what you want. And mm -hmm. so when we focus on the thing that's happening, mm -hmm. which is, which it's hard not to right? truly, right. Yep. but that's what, that's where we stay. Right. right. It's like, can I imagine what it's going to be like when I stand up and it doesn't hurt? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? Can what I lead I can into that? Right. Yeah. So that your thoughts are already moving you and your body in that direction. Exactly. Like that, it almost sounds, um, I had a lady actually one day tell me that I was just doing pseudoscience and I should mm. be mine. Like, but I, oh, we have to embrace the magic too. There's a whole nother level to us. Absolutely. To our experience. And that's that you call it pseudoscience. You call it fruit for what I call it. Yeah. magic. Like yeah. it, it's the, the unexplainable. Yeah. Piece. I agree. There's such an intuitiveness to our yes. insides that we will never fully appreciate because we can't always prove these things. So I, oh. I completely agree. Uh, but yeah. again, there's, there's, we're at a good time now where I really believe that a lot of the research is, is truly like the science has started to catch up to, you know, yes. what a lot of the holistic practitioners have been saying. And I touched on it earlier, but the whole inflammation thing, the holistic community has been saying for a long time, you know, don't try to rid yourself of inflammation when you have an acute injury, you know, that inflammation process is actually really important to your healing. Yeah. That's when it becomes sometimes too much, that's when it's a problem. So we are yeah. such, we're such a matter of balance, but anyway, you did touch on it and I didn't even really intend to go here up front, but I think it's an important thing to at least mention is thank you for bringing it up the head and the gut, because the gut is the second brain. And we know with chronic pain that the brain and the body are completely connected. We also know that the gut is also very important for emotion regulation and immune function in general. So if we are not addressing nutrition as a strategy, we're not addressing the emotional side of everything. And also they, they do tie in to, together. So I think it's at least important for us to, to mention that we need to think about our digestive system to help with our overall health and well-being. I know I don't have to say that to you because you know this more than I do, but it's important for recovery. Yeah. Well, and I, I think like one of the, I think one of the reasons some that nutrition is, 
maybe not explored as a upfront option is because it can be so much, mm-hmm. right? Like, well, what do I need to eat? When do I eat it? What yeah. are, like, oh, my digestion and my immune yeah. system and like, but we just get to understand that it's all connected. Right. right. And so when you make decisions around food that say you're like thinking about gut health, yep. okay, those are going to be yep. good quality foods with fiber that are basically prebiotics for happy bacteria to flourish in your gut, yep. which is going to impact your mind. It's yep. all connected, right? So we can, I think sort of sometimes, and those are a lot of those foods are going to be like our anti-inflammatory foods are, right. you know, right. lots of antioxidants, lots of nutrients. So it's yeah. all, we can kind of all pour it into the funnel. We end up with yep. a good quality, whole food based strategy of eating. Right. right? And yep. I saw a thing, I'm not going to use the totally, I don't always use the word diet because it's got so much like noise around it, Right. but that I can't remember if it was a Greek, the definition anyway, like the way back, the, it actually just means lifestyle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's like, take out all the noise. This is just the way that I nourish my body, right? Right. It's just my lifestyle. Yep. I love it. I do think it's important to just pull, keep pulling it back. Like you did a second ago about the simplicity of it. Like you said, we're not really looking for anything too complicated. Just get color, just get good, wholesome um, balance to your meal. Uh, Shopping on the outsides of the grocery store as much as you can is a simple way to, you know, make sure you're getting in or at least purchasing (laughs) the, the healthy stuff. Now, just to touch quickly on the whole social side. Now, when it comes to um, chronic illness, pain, well-being, the social side is kind of lumps everything else into it. So things like culture, race, you know, care that you're getting or care that you're not getting, uh, your social supports around you, family, friends, co-workers, the work environment you're in, all of those also impact, right? And so you had touched on it with your surgery that, you know, you felt like you had a good support system in place, which allowed you to really be in the right mindset before you went into surgery, even though your anxiety level was up knowing wow, what's about to happen. You at least had in place people who could support you could be there to cheer you on from the sidelines who could prepare food for you. I think that's a really important thing to explore before you go into surgery as well. And also, I think what I love about your style is, and I think it's an important thing to remind people of, is that food is joy. Food could be joy if it's not right now, right? And so if there's any way at all of incorporating that joy back into your food, and, and, you know, joy could be many different things. A lot of people will be reaching towards maybe junk food because that's what makes them feel best. But we're encouraging you to try to find joy in the color, try to find joy in the different textures, the different flavors, just that um, the sheer joy of knowing you are doing some great things at a cellular level Mm -hmm. to help you heal, to help you be more resilient and to help you have better outcomes with your surgery. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. The whole, the food is medicine, but Mm -hmm. like life itself is medicine Mm -hmm. for us. If we can, like you said, extract the joy out of the moments, yep. our cells feel that. Right. right. Like if I think of the word inflammation, mm-hmm. I want to ask the question, like, what is inflammatory in my life right now? What is causing angst? What's causing heat or fire that I don't, you know, like yeah. that's what my right. mind goes to. So it's like, what are, what are the things that just make you really happy? Mm-hmm. And can right. you... And can you allow yourself or find a way to bring a little bit more of that in? Right. Right. Yep. Because like we said at the beginning, when it comes to chronic pain, chronic illness, everything matters. And so connecting with loved ones is part of your recovery process. Uh, Connecting with loved ones before you go into is only going to mitigate that anxiety. So it's, it's the social aspect is important. Uh, Celebrating the magic Uh, I know I'm sounding a little bit like life is full of unicorns and fairies and it's not, but I just want to make sure that people understand this is an important part of recovery is just, you know, if we can go in there with a mindset of, yes, this is going to be a challenge, but I'm up for it. I am capable. I am healthy. I've done all that I can to prepare myself for this. And I am looking forward to all the things that are going to be after I come through my recovery. Mm -hmm. 
far healthier place to come from than the complete opposite. So totally. Yeah. yeah and this idea of like that we are, you know, even when we're really struggling, we can, we are creative mm-hmm. by nature. We, you know, we have resolve and resiliency within us, even when it's been stuffed down until to just believe that mm-hmm. that is there. Right. And if you don't have a support system, mm-hmm. you could do something for yourself to find some aspect that would mm-hmm. support you. Right. If, right. If there aren't people there that can bring you food, can you find someone in the community to help you? Can you right. search out options? You know, like that right. we, we do all have that ability. Sometimes we have to, like you said, kind of like dig it up because yeah. it's been, yeah. it's hard when we're hurting, yeah. but we can't, we can, you yeah. absolutely can. Yeah, I agree. And I think one last point I wanted to touch on was that the, the kind of the overlap between chronic pain and nutrition and behaviors is, and you, you just tweaked my memory on this one, is that when you do something long enough, you get really good at it. Just like learning to play the piano, learning to drive, right? And nutrition is very much like that. So too is chronic pain. Unfortunately, with chronic pain, the more we do something, i.e. avoid things or you know, focus on the pain, the better we get at doing those things. Now, nutrition is the same. The more you start eating a bit of color, the better you get at it, right? And you do it enough times and you do become better at it without even having to think about it. So yes, it is a process. Yes, it takes time and practice, but we are absolutely capable of doing those little steps. So yeah, yeah, yeah. well said, well said. So there you go. Well, uh, I just want to ask you if there's anything else that you feel we didn't touch on that you feel is important to touch on before we say our goodbyes today. Um, There's just an analogy that was actually a friend that shared it with me and I'll share it with you because I think it's so cool that any time that we're moving through something and you, you tweaked me with this because Mm -hmm. you were talking about doing things over and over again, right. Mm -hmm. That we just have, we have patterns and habits and the way that we've done things is what we know, right? but that's not all there is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we need a bit of support to help us see beyond that, Mm -hmm. which is, I think what, you know, you are offering to people. It's what I offer to people. My Mm -hmm. friend likened it to like a spaghetti sauce jar, right. That we're like, all the stuff we're like surrounded by the sauce and we're in it and we can't see anything because we're in the jar. Right. And the the ingredients are actually on the outside. They're written right there for you. Right. Right. You just can't see them because you're stuck in the sauce. Oh, I like that. Isn't that awesome? So it's, it's like that we, you can ask for support wherever that is Mm. to help you see those ingredients so that you can, get out of the jar. Yeah. There's so much more outside of the jar. Oh my gosh. Right? I'm, I'm going to have to use that one. If, if use it, yeah, okay she's, a, she's a somatic therapist here in high river where I live and oh. she's a beautiful, beautiful soul. And when she said that, I was like, that makes so much sense. To oh, me. that is so well said. We, yep. can, we can be digging and digging and doing all the things and we can't figure out what it is. Right, right. Because we just can't see it yet. So and get you can't see you. through the sauce. You can't see no. through the soup, right? When you're stuck in the soup, when you're stuck in the sauce. You, you yeah. Can't. And it's not your fault. No, it's not. Right. Your fault. It's just overwhelming for sure. Yeah. And exactly. that's our job, right? Is to break the over- overwhelm exactly. down. So Diane, how can someone uh, connect with you if they want to talk to yeah. you? Yeah. So um, most of my content on LinkedIn, which is where we connected, is like driven to the student athlete population, the parents, the coaches, and people that are looking to kind of work with nutrition in that, in that light. Um, my Instagram feed, I have the guts also there, but I also just do my general holistic nutrition and lifestyle coaching. Um, Mm -hmm. and the, the, whatever it's called tag or what's my, my name, (laughs) my handle is, um, DJ wellness. So okay. that's there. Okay. Um, I can also be reached by email anytime. And that's just info at djwellnessconsulting.com. Um, and my website, which is geared to, again, a more general population of people seeking out nutritional support, not necessarily just the athletes, is the www.djwellness.com. 
djwellnessconsulting.com. Okay. I'm writing this down. <laughs> It's kind of long. <laughs> That's okay. I will, uh, I'll definitely link it within the podcast um, yeah. and also on our YouTube feed as well. Um, for any of our listeners, uh, viewers, if this was a value to you, um, I encourage you to go to fill out the quiz. Cause if you're here listening to this, you are, I believe inching either inching closer to change, getting ready to launch yourself into something different. Um, and if you think you are, I'm going to send you to my quiz, um, at pain number two possibilities.com forward slash quiz. And there it will help you to sort of understand, okay, where are you in the stages of change? Are you ready to go? Are you not quite there yet? And then we'll give you some valuable resources uh, as well. Diane, thank you so very much. This has been a really important topic. We could talk for days about this, but I'm hoping <laughs> this just gives a nut context to get people prepped and ready to go. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the work you do. Mm, well, thank you again. It was really awesome to come on here and chat with you today. You're awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. Too. I'm going to try that again. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I cannot get that out. Oh my God. Woo. Sorry about that. <laughs>